Welcome everyone to the Stanford Cancer Institute's Breakthroughs in Cancer Seminar Series. Um, we're exceptionally lucky today to have Dr. Jennifer Grandes from UCSF. Uh, she's a leading surgeon scientist in the area of head and neck cancer. She is also an invaluable member of our external advisory board. So we're really happy to have you here, um, Dr. Grandes. Um, I also want to welcome all of you, both those of you who are here in person and those of you here who are on Zoom. So this is actually the last seminar in our 2023 seminar series. As, as you know, we started this series less than a year ago, and the goal was to really provide a forum for translational and clinical science at Stanford. Um, and what we've tried to do and will continue to do is to bring national and international experts in the broad areas of, that cancer science represents to Stanford to present their cutting edge research and to meet with both trainees and faculty at Stanford. And as we uh, come to the end of this first year, I really want to thank all the speakers and really want to thank all of you for helping make this series a success for your participation and your engagement with both the speakers and, um, uh, and with all the activities around, uh, around this series. Now, the 2024 cycle uh, starts on January 9th, and we have a fantastic set of speakers lined up, so I hope that we will, you will continue to support this series. Uh, look out for a name for all those speakers, probably will be released somewhere in, in November timeframe. So we would look forward to wel welcoming you then. So for this series, uh, for this seminar today, for those of you who are on Zoom, please put your questions in the Q&A box and there'll be a Q&A session at the end of this um, and we'll try to convey those questions to the speaker. For those of you who are here in person, uh, please join us for a reception that will happen immediately after this seminar. As you exit the seminar room, take a left, and we'll have some refreshments and food uh, in the patio, um, and you, get a, you can get a chance to ask the speaker more questions and interact with each other. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. John Sun Wu to uh, introduce Dr. Grandis. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Jennifer Grandis uh, for this afternoon's talk. Um, as Raj mentioned, Dr. Grandis is a surgeon scientist and the Robert K. Warby Distinguished Professor in Head and Neck Cancer at the, at the, um, in the Department of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery at UCSF. Her accomplishments and awards are many, and I can't list them all, but I wanted to highlight a couple of them. She's been inducted into the National Academy of Medicine, the American Society for Clinical Investigation. She's a recipient of an art um, of an NCI R35 Outstanding Investigator Award. She was a co-PI of a head and neck cancer spore, um, of which there have only been a few or a handful uh, ever uh, in head and neck. Um, she, of her many accomplishments, I think the one that is probably most profound is that she was one of the first to show that the epidermal growth factor receptor is overexpressed in head and neck cancer and that targeting it or STAT3 signaling uh, downstream of the EGFR has a profound anti-tumor activity. And that work led to the FDA approval of cetuximab, which is um, now commonly used in head and neck. Uh, Dr. Grandis also co-chaired the TCGA working group for head and neck cancer and was a senior author of the paper in Science describing the results of that work. Um, and she's, over her career, she's published over 400 publications. Uh, but I think the most lasting contribution to the field of head and neck cancer is the fact that Dr. Grandis was one of the first uh, laboratory-based surgeon scientists in head and neck. And um, that has really been the inspiration for a whole generation of head and neck surgeon scientists, myself included. So welcome, Jane. Thank you for letting me come and speak and not have to get on an airplane. <laughs> it is such a treat to be able to just hop into an Uber after my lab meeting yesterday morning and to be here and spend the last couple of days with you. It's been such a pleasure. So I want to take you now through a little bit of a journey. I'm going to pull up my slides and talk about head and neck cancer translational medicine. So I want to start out by really giving a shout out to Team Science. It's a word that is used, maybe overused, but what I want to mean, what I mean by this is that our historical emphasis on individual exceptionalism at the expense of really forming meaningful relationships with other colleagues and trainees is ridiculous. 
And the sooner we move away from over-prioritizing first and senior authorship and fighting about these things that don't make any sense at all and just emphasizing how we contribute to the work, we will just deliver so much more uh, value to our society and we'll be much happier. And one of the things that uh, I did when I moved to UCSF, honestly, because I was just too busy with my uh, vice chancellor job, is I agreed to co-lead a lab with two PIs. I'm standing there in the front with Dan Johnson, who was a longtime colleague, an independent investigator from Pittsburgh, who decided that he wanted to come back to San Francisco, where he'd done his postdoc. He's now the vice chair for research in our department, and Patrick Ha, who runs our head and neck surgery program. And having three uh, co-PIs oversee this diverse group of young people has been just enormously beneficial to all of us. And I wish I'd done it early on. It was so lonely being a little CEO. So um, my disclosures is that I uh, have completed um, an investigator-initiated clinical trial with support from Insight. I'm not going to talk about that today. I do some scientific consulting, you know, here in uh, the Bay Area, and I have uh, invented a STAT3 inhibitor, and those patents have been exclusively licensed to a startup company called Blue Dot Bio, and I will talk about that drug a little bit today. So when I talk about head and neck cancer, I'm really talking about squamous cell carcinoma that that arises in the mucosal surfaces of the air digestive tract. And I know that there are people on Zoom, so I need to use my handy dandy pointer here. <laughs> Excuse me. So what I really mean is oral cavity, oropharynx, hypopharynx, and larynx. Getting back to the microphone so people can hear. The most interesting thing to me about this slide is a problem that I still don't understand despite having had a collaborative grant with an institute in China to study this. There are very few viral associated cancers and Epstein-Barr virus is responsible for a substantial proportion of nasopharyngeal carcinomas. And we now know today that human papillomavirus is the cause of an enormous number of oropharyngeal cancers, the vast majority in most institutions where we look at these kinds of things. Trust me, when the, my head and neck surgical colleagues and I look at a patient, there's no magic demarcation line <laughs> that the nasopharynx just sort of bleeds into the oropharynx. And the fact that these mucosal sites are rich reservoirs for viruses that can cause malignant transformation is something that we do not understand. And I think we have an incredible opportunity to figure this out, particularly because there are probably more people from southern China in the Bay Area than anywhere else in the country. And the instance of Epstein-Barr virus associated nasopharyngeal carcinoma is reasonably high, and I know that Quinn Lee and others have a program to study this. So I've broken this talk up into three parts. Number one, who is at risk for getting head and neck cancer? Well, this is the obvious culprit. I took a picture of this when I was in France uh, about a decade ago, and I thought, oh man, we should do this, because if you had to pay money and pick up a pack of cigarettes with a fungating head and neck cancer, you may think twice about smoking. But of course, the industry figured out that you could have a really nice container to put this pack of cigarettes in, so you don't, not, don't have to look at the horrible picture. And the uh, tobacco lobbies are strong enough that we can't do that kind of advertising. And tobacco products still account for the majority of squamous cell carcinomas in the oral cavity worldwide. But over my lifetime, when I have to say, and we've gone back and looked at histology records at the University of Pittsburgh, there were very few cases of HPV positive squamous cell carcinoma of the pharynx in the 1950s, 60s, 70s. But starting in the 80s and really increasing uh, um, um, very, you know, uh, logarithmically to today, we now have a true epidemic of HPV positive head and neck cancer. And here in the Bay Area, where many parents choose not to vaccinate their children against HPV for reasons that are really inscrutable but important for us to understand, those of us who study and treat this cancer are going to be in business for a very long time. But the first cancer that I really want to talk to you about, and you know, John and I talked about this at a meeting this past summer, but I am so moved by the plight of these patients, is Fanconi anemia patients who develop solid tumors, almost all of which are squamous cell carcinomas, the head and neck. I'm on the scientific advisory board of this foundation. And what I have learned over the course of the last three years is that um, at least once or twice a month, we are engaged to provide virtual tumor board services to some treating physician 
around the world who has a patient with Fanconi anemia and head and neck cancer. So there are centers of excellence throughout the world and in the United States for children to manage the bone marrow diathesis. And, uh, but these centers are not expert at treating these children when they develop head and neck cancer, which they will do sometime in their teens, 20s, and at the very latest in their 30s. So these people are scattered all over the world. They go to a treating physician, and for almost all of us, it would be our first and our only patient with Fanconi anemia with head and neck cancer. We don't have any clinical trials. We are terrified of giving them cytotoxic uh, agents like radiation and chemotherapy. Surgery remains the only option, and there is a very limited series of uh, um, um, clinical uh, outcomes to really guide us. So a very talented uh, medical student, now an ENT resident at UCSF Rex Lee, took this opportunity to write a review article about a year and a half ago. And so we were able to identify 131 cases in the literature, including 16 squamous uh, of the esophagus. Um, and with all of them, as they say, surgical resection with curative intent was the primary modality. Radiation appears to be tolerated. You gotta take a few breaks, but in general, the patients can get through external beam radiation therapy. Protons have been tried, but again, there's no cohort that has been reported, no uh, um, um, evidence-based um, um, data for which to make decisions on. And each of our targeting agents, mostly cetuximab, have been reported in about 12 different cases, and they appear to have some e efficacy and they're tolerated. Very limited reports, anecdotal reports only on uh, immunotherapy. The dogma has been that bone marrow transplant is uh, uh, um, precludes a subsequent use of immunotherapy, and the vast majority of these patients, well, 80% of them have undergone transplantation. But my message to all of us is we really need evidence, we really need data, and we need to help save these children's lives. So the genetics of Fanconi anemia head and neck cancer were published um, about a year ago by a, a collaborator uh, of ours, Agata, um, at uh, Rockefeller University. And I will just tell you that the, the <laughs> we've all wondered if um, squamous cell carcinomas that arise in non-smokers, non-drinkers are different from squamous cell carcinomas that arrive in smokers and drinkers, they're not, they're the same. And of course, the genetics of Fanconi anemia head and neck cancer are really the same as the genetics of uh, head and neck cancer that arises in other populations, although there are more amplifications uh, potentially. And of course, there's the germline mutations in the Fanconi genes. So what we have done in our laboratory, and I'd be delighted to collaborate with anybody, is we're trying to develop relevant than preclinical models. So our lab is pretty good at making patient-derived xenografts. We have about 100 from uh, uh, non-FA head and neck cancer patients. We've written a lot about what these models look like. They look very similar to the patients. They're more similar to the patients than the cell lines. And so this is just the histology of three of the models that we've got up and going. And I'm going to tell you a lot about um, the first model because we've characterized that most extensively. And what we noticed about this tumor is that it had amplification of EGFR and amplification of PIK3CA. Um, FA2 and FA3, we don't have as many, much information on them. That's still percolating, um, but uh, histologically, they look very similar. But if you are a medical oncologist, you realize that there are very few tools in the toolkit to treat patients with head and neck cancer. And the standard therapy, which is carboplatinum or cisplatinum, is absolutely contraindicated in patients with Fanconi anemia. We will kill them if we give them. In fact, some adults get diagnosed with Fanconi anemia when they develop a head and neck cancer. They're given platinum and they have this extraordinary toxic reaction and they go back and it looks like they had Fanconi anemia that was just unrecognized. So this is all we've got to play with. So I'll tell you about what we've learned about this first FAPDX. So I told you, so this was a 13-year-old, and he died after his first surgical resection, so he never had the opportunity to re receive adjuvant therapy or systemic therapy. But when we profiled his tumor, we knew it had an EGFR amplification, and even though EGFR amplification is not a predictive biomarker for response to EGFR inhibitors, including cetuximab, in 
the non-FA population, we wondered whether or not in this population it would provide some useful information. And I think you can appreciate that there's very exquisite sensitivity of this particular uh, PDX to cetuximab. And at very low concentrations, there appears to be tumor regression. But in contrast, when we look at the uh, PDX that we developed from patient number two and patient number three, it's stone cold resistant to cetuximab. So this notion that we're going to find a single modality that's going to be amenable for treatment in this rare population is naive. There's going to be as much heterogeneity among these patients as there is among non-FA patients. It's just the, the situation is really dire. And as I mentioned to Nate, the, the situation for PDX number two is urgent. So one of the really extraordinary things about this foundation is the scientists and the families meet together. So I got to know the patient and his mother that we've created model number two. This patient uh, works for a big biotech company. He's a very bright guy. He has survived two bouts of head and neck cancer, both of which were treated with surgery alone. And his model is resistant to every single treatment that we have tested thus far. It also is one of only two PDX models that I've ever seen to be spontaneously metastatic. So I am really interested in collaborating with anyone who wants to understand how we can quickly learn what this model will respond to because this young man, he's 28 years old, he's gonna recur and he is gonna die unless we figure out how to treat his cancer. And when we look at the relative sensitivity of these FA models compared to non-FA models, you can see that model number one is exquisitely sensitive and models number two and three are much less um, um, sensitive. And this reproduces the heterogeneity that we see in the non-FA models. When we do uh, biochemistry, we can see in this first model that sensitive cetuximab that we can induce apoptosis, we can induce, uh, we can block uh, EGFR expression, EGFR phosphorylation, and this all makes a whole lot of sense in terms of biology. I think I mentioned to you that model number three uh, has an amplification. Actually, model number three has a canonical mutation of uh, PIK3CA. And so what we have now done is uh, looked at biochemically what that means. This uh, model this uh, has activation of phospho-AKT, which we expect. You can see model number two has no EGFR, so it's not surprising that it's not responding to any of the EGFR inhibitors that we are tested. And I'll just pivot to say that the only clinical trial that I know of that is about to get underway is in Europe, and they're going to use um, a fatinib, an EGFR HER2 inhibitor, an irreversible tyrosine kinase inhibitor, and it's very clear to me that that drug is not going to work for patients like number two because there is no EGFR and therefore it's very unlikely this drug will work. And when we tested model number three to cetuximab alone and in combination with alpalisib, which is the only FDA approved P110 alpha inhibitor, we do see an augmentation of effect, although not tumor regression, when those two agents are, are uh, combined. Sadly, this patient has also succumbed to his disease, so there's no real world practicality to these experiments. So from my perspective, in Fanconi anemia, we have a real paucity of models, whether it be cell lines, genetically engineered mouse models, and PDXs. Uh, the foundation is supporting research to create models, and I would uh, guide you to their page. Uh, limited inf information on what happens to these patients when they, in fact, we conduct this tumor board and we have no idea whether the treating physicians take our advice. We don't know whether the patients respond to the treatments that they've been given, and we don't know what their toxicity profile is. So until we actually start collecting this data, we are still going to be playing in the dark. So that's who gets uh, head and neck cancer, and now I'm going to switch gears slightly to precision medicine and the opportunities and challenges in head and neck cancer. So you heard that I had the privilege of uh, being part of the TCGA working group, and this was the paper that we published um, in Nature as a result of that initial effort. And what we found is that the PIK3CA oncogene was by far the most frequently mutated oncogene in head and neck cancer. And about half of the HPV positive cases had an alteration. Most commonly, it was mutation in PIK3CA, but about a third of the HPV negative cases also had an alteration in this oncogene. 
So we looked at the whole pathway, and indeed, of all the oncogenic pathways, mutation in this pathway was by far the most common in head and neck, and our preliminary evidence in our preclinical models would suggest that these mutations can be a predictive biomarker. The question is to what, and we'll get there in just a second. So in this particular uh, study, we knew that one-third of the mutations that arose in PIK3CA in head and neck were in the non-canonical regions, and we did know what the relevance of those mutations were for patient treatment. And at the time, there was a postdoc from Korea who was in our lab. He was doing a basket trial in Korea, and he said, you know, I just had this mutation uh, arise in a patient that's on our trial. Nobody knows anything about this mutation, and yet the patient responded to single-agent alpalisib. So a one-year durable response then progressed and was put on immunotherapy. The patient's actually still alive now, and it's been about six years. So at this point, we created a model to uh, agnostically test the activity of different mutations. We have a serum-dependent head and neck cancer cell line. When we take away serum from the media, the cells die. When we put a mutation into these cells by lentivirus and we take away serum, if the cells survive, we conclude that it's a gain-of-function mutation, whether it be direct or indirect, and we go from there. So we modeled the mutation in this patient, and indeed, it was a gain-of-function mutation. The cells survived when we took away serum, and in the cells that contain this mutation, we saw increased activation of the pathway as demonstrated by phosphorylation of AKT, and it was very comparable to one of the canonical mutations that in the uh, um, kinase domain. Um, actually, the helical domain. And so then we then tested all of the non-canonical uh, mutations in head and neck cancer. We published this in JCI about a year and a half ago. And what we found with this a relative arbitrary threshold is about two-thirds to three-quarters of the mutations that were non-canonical were also activating. And then we asked the question, did it matter which model we used? And so in collaboration with Gordon Mills Lab, um, uh, first at MD Anderson, now in Oregon, he also modeled these same mutations in his IL-3-dependent BAF3 model, in a breast epithelial model, and had collaborators in Israel who had modeled these mutations in an HPV-positive HeLa model. And so it really seems that an activating mutation is active across a diversity of cell lineages, and it's not head and neck specific. But what I think it means is that in our molecular tumor boards, and first of all, I really think we should be sequencing all of our head and neck cancer patients and not wait until they have recurrent metastatic disease and really consider testing some of these precision medicine hypotheses up front before they are unlikely to be cured. But we next asked the question as part of the Cancer Cell Map Initiative with Nevin Krogan at UCSF and Trey Eidecker in San Diego, was there any evidence that the protein-protein interactions conferred by PIK3CA mutations were unique? And it turns out that they were. There is a PIK3CA mutant interactome. And then we further asked the question, well, did it matter what mutation? And it turns out it does. So here we have the two mutations in the helical domain, in contrast, h 10 47R, which is in the kinase muta- domain, but the helical domain mutations enrich interaction with HER3, a number of their member of the EGFR family member that is overexpressed in head and neck cancer. And looking at this data, we said, well, if this is meaningful, it means that if we treat preclinical models or patients with a HER3 inhibitor, it will only be active in the setting of the E542, E545 mutations, and the H1047R mutation will not confer sensitivity to a HER3 inhibitor, and that is exactly what we found. So in collaboration with Silvio Gutkin's lab at UC San Diego, also part of this cancer cell map initiative, We engineered a a head and neck cancer cell line, Cal27, to express these different mutations, and only uh, the wild type and the helical domain mutations were sensitive to the HER3 inhibitor. The kinase domain mutation was stone cold negative, and this really ultimately served as the basis for the science paper uh, that came out a little over a year ago um, and has real translational significance in the setting of HER3 inhibitors and where they should be tested. In addition, in collaboration with Julie Bauman when she was at the University of Arizona, we did a window trial. So again, I'm looking for collaborators. So to date, we've treated five patients on this protocol. We biopsied the patients. Um, We have their pretreatment specimen. We have their post-treatment specimen. 
All of them received a two to three week course of alpalisib. And the question is, what are the correlated biomarker studies that we want to do now to correlate with the treatment response? And so I'm really open to ideas and collaborations. But I will tell you the punchline that what we've learned in head and neck cancer is that some patients respond to P110 alpha inhibitors without a genetic alteration to PIK3CA, and some patients with PIK3CA alterations do not respond to P110 alpha inhibitors. But it is more likely that they'll respond in the setting of the mutation. And I think what I've learned from this is that nature of the mutation matters, and we need to understand more about the biology of these mutations and how it rewires the cancer cell before we just bring these drugs into our clinical armamentarium. But I'm going to switch gears to tell you a story that really makes me feel optimistic about the impact of the work that we do. So about a decade ago, the Nurses' Health Study at Harvard published this paper and is an epidemiologic study. And the essential observation is that in colon cancers that harbor a PIK3CO mutation, when the patient is on aspirin, and aspirin is a relatively well-recognized chemopreventive agent for colon cancer, they seem to have an improved survival. And at this point, I had done a lot of work on G-protein couple receptor signaling and crosstalk. I knew a lot about mutations and PI3 kinase and signaling. And so I thought, hum, I wonder if this similar observation can be made in head and neck, and could we possibly think about nonsteroidal anti-inflammatory drugs as a chemopreventive agent in the adjuvant setting because we can cure a lot of patients initially, but recurrent metastatic disease is recently the, is really the killer. So one of the huge advantages of having a spore, which we had for 20 years in Pittsburgh, is so we had a lot of tissues, we had really deep phenotypic data on the patients. And so I convinced a really talented MD PhD student that this was a question worth an answering, but I knew that if the answer was no, it would be get published in a lower impact journal than if the answer was yes, but he was still willing to do it. So we took this cohort and there ended up being 266 cases. And we went into the EMR and we asked how many of these patients were placed on NSAIDs after their diagnosis of head and neck cancer. And trust me, no head and neck cancer physician would prescribe NSAIDs. They were almost always prescribed for cardiovascular reasons. And we knew whether or not their tumors had a PIK3CA alteration because we did sequencing and we did FISH and we also looked at HPV. And the results were really striking. So you can see that when a tumor is stone cold wild type for PIK3CA, it doesn't matter if they take NSAIDs or not. Their survival at five years is what we expect it to be. It's about 50%. However, if they have an alteration of the oncogene and they don't take an NSAID, their survival is worse. And this is true for many cancers where it's been looked at, particularly breast cancer and colon cancer. And this is not surprising. It's an oncogene. However, if they just happen to be taking NSAIDs for at least six months and 75% of our patients took baby aspirin, their survival at five years went from about 30% to about 80%. And this was really remarkable. We even saw the survival curves flip in HPV positive disease, which has a better outcome. So then we went back to our animal models, which were imperfect, because remember, these patients were treated with curative intent. And we studied the tumor, and then we studied their outcome. We didn't study um, their tumor in response to a specific therapy. However, um, we had made a lot of PDXs. And so we had pick 3 ca mutant PDXs, we had pick 3 ca wild type PDXs, and we put them into mice, and we treated them with about six different NSAIDs. I'm showing you the cell and DAC data, but we looked at indomethacin and celecoxib and aspirin. And in every single case, the wild type PDXs was stone cold insensitive to an NSAID. Not surprising, we don't treat cancer with aspirin. However, if the PDX had an activating mutation of PIK3CA, it showed increased growth. Again, it's an oncogene. And when we treated the mice with any of these NSAIDs, we saw significant anti-tumor efficacy. And then we harvested the blood from these mice and we measured prostaglandin E2 because we hypothesized that, remember, the patients are telling us the truth. We're just sometimes not smart enough to figure it out. 
And what our patients were telling us is that after they had their curative intent treatment, something was happening over the next five years as a result of their PIK3CA amplification or mutation to stimulate tumor recurrence. And so we hypothesized that because of the signaling pathway that prostaglandin E2 was likely to be an immunosuppressant of the tumor microenvironment and, um, and lead to a new tumor formation. So we looked at PG2. We then went back to our uh, uh, immunocompetent models. This happens to be Mach 1 cells, and we engineered them to express a mutation. And indeed, when we looked at the percentage of NK cells or CD8 positive T cells, we could actually see a significant decrease when we introduced amplification or mutation of PIK3CA. So this is the trial that we are hoping to do through the cooperative group mechanism over the next few years. We are going to take head and neck cancer patients who've been treated with curative intent, and they will be randomized to low-dose aspirin or placebo for two years, and we will look at disease-specific survival. And if someone had told me at the start of my career that one of my major contributions would be that I would save people's lives by um, deciding who should take aspirin and who shouldn't, I would have been shocked. But it's really gratifying because, of course, the low cost and the relative low toxicity. Now, I often get the question, well, would I not give aspirin to everybody? But I think those of us who read the literature should be reminded of the numerous studies published in the New England Journal and others that aspirin in unselected populations has toxicity. My husband, the cardiologist, reminds me of this all the time. And so indeed, while I think it might be a cost-effective way to go and not require greater scrutiny, I do think that doing the prospective trial is essential before we change our clinical practice. And then finally, I want to talk about drug resistance because, of course, if our patients had durable responses to all these drugs that are active, we would not have any patients succumb to cancer. So we know that mutations of oncoproteins are common mechanisms of drug resistance that has been very well studied in other malignancies, um, and, and including EGFR mutations and all small cell lung cancer. But when this arises, it's really a game of whack-a-mole. How do we create the next molecule that's anticipating the drug resistance mutation to overcome that particular alteration? So we, as John mentioned, have been studying signal transducer and activator transcription 3 or STAT3 for a very long time. Now, the reason I started studying STAT3 was because my head and neck cancer patients told me it mattered, not in so many words, but when I looked at their tumors, they all had um, activation of STAT3, and this was particularly true in the setting of resistance to cisplatinum or resistance to cetuximab. So when I took out tumors from patients who were resistant to these systemic agents, STAT3 was the most important factor that was increased. So I knew that STAT3 needed to be explored as a therapeutic target. And I was raised at the University of Pittsburgh, which has been a hotbed of immunology for a long time. And so my immunology colleagues reminded me that STAT3 was an important target both for the cancer cell and for the immune system. Because if we could block STAT3, we could increase anti-tumor immunity in the microenvironment, and that would be a double boon for cancer treatment. So around this time, um, uh, Jeff Settleman reached out to me. This is when he was at Genentech. And he's like, all right, tell me about STAT3. I've heard you talk about STAT3. I didn't really believe it. And I just care. I just did this you know, uh, a, a study. And I looked at drug, drug resistance me mechanisms. And the one that keeps popping out all the time is STAT3. So I think it's fairly agreed upon that STAT3 is an attractive therapeutic target. There's just one small problem. It's undruggable, or at least that's what the dogma would lend you to believe. It's an intranuclear transcription factor that lacks enzymatic activity, which means it's really hard to think about drugging it. And what we know is that there are many upstream receptor, non-receptor kinases that contribute to STAT3 activation, and many of us have tested whether targeting JAK or EGFR or SARC etc. will really abrogate STAT3 and lead to a durable benefit, and the answer is it doesn't because there are other mechanisms that quickly reactivate STAT3. So maybe one of the 
benefits of being an MD-only physician scientist is it didn't occur to me that I couldn't do this. <laughs> so I worked with some wonderful scientists from Carnegie Mellon and otherwise to try to think about how we could trick the cell into thinking there was active stat 3 signaling, but it was just a dummy or a decoy. So I got this idea from reading a paper in blood about uh, STAT6 in HIV. And I thought, well, if you can do it for STAT6, you should be able to do it for STAT3. So essentially what we've designed is a large, small molecule that uh, shuttles between the cytoplasm and the nucleus. It binds to STAT3 dimers. It binds to the STAT3 response elements in target genes, and it, it shuts off STAT3 signaling with resultant anti-tumor effects. But one of the things that has occurred to us is that it may avoid the most common mechanisms of drug resistance, because resistance. think about it. If the response is to mutate STAT3, well, that's a good thing. <laughs> it doesn't mean the drug won't be effective. It just means STAT3 will no longer be an active pathway. So mutation of STAT3 would actually be beneficial to the patients and not lead to resistance necessarily to the drug. So we have a first generation molecule that we took all the way to phase zero trial. And in our initial uh, molecule, we sequenced um, the smallest fragment of the CFOS promoter. And in all of our preclinical models, we had a mutant control that differed by a single base pair that did not bind to STAT3. We reported that uh, it competed to genomic DNA, the, the mutant had no uh, effects. And when we injected this molecule directly into the xenografts in our mice, we saw profound anti-tumor efficacy. And this was around the time that the FDA introduced the concept of a phase zero trial. So we did it, why not? And it was the easiest clinical trial I've ever done. Took our patients to the operating room. We biopsied the tumor. We were gonna resect it anyways. And then we injected the tumor with either the decoy or with saline. And I had a reviewer once say, well, why couldn't you use the mutant control? And my response was, because these are human beings <laughs> and you can't give a mutant control to a human being. But um, the only endpoint that I was interested in is, was there any evidence that there was downregulation of STAT3 target genes? Because that was the most important biochemical effect. And part of me kind of hoped it wouldn't work because I knew I was never going to pursue an intratumoral platform because I had already done that with a the gene therapy and it was just too cumbersome and I didn't believe in it, but it worked. So the it uh, downregulated STAT3 target genes and the decoy treated tumors. And remember, these tumors were only exposed to about four to six hours of the material because they were having a tumor resection. So at this point, we go to our friend, Danith Lee, who's a nucleotide chemist at Carnegie Mellon. And we went through about uh, two dozen iterations to try to um, stabilize our molecule so that it retained biologic activity, but it was more stable so it could be given systemically. And here's what we've come up with. And this is the agent that we've patented and that we are taking to clinical trials in humans. And we see dose-dependent anti-tumor effects. And now we're giving it by tail vein injection into the mice with xenografts. A very um, a smart reviewer said, okay, but what about uh, cetuximab? And what about an FDA approved uh, JAK-STAT inhibitor? So we looked at ruxolitinib, very little activity. I can tell you now I've done a window trial with ruxolitinib and the best response we got was stable disease. So I just don't think that there's really room for JAK inhibitor in the um, uh, clinical uh, armamentarium for head and neck cancer. And I think you can appreciate that uh, the decoy was more effective than cetuximab. And when we combined cetuximab with the decoy, we actually saw tumor regression, which was very encouraging. Then to test the immune hypotheses, we went to uh, our immunocompetent models, and indeed, we see now compared to a scramble control, we get increased CDA positive T cells, increased NK cells, and increased NKT cells in the tumors treated systemically with the decoy. And of course, in this era of immunotherapy for head and neck cancer, we had to ask the question, how did this fit in with immune checkpoint inhibitors? And we see augmented effects when we combine the decoy with immune checkpoint inhibitors inhibitors and dramatic downregulation down of T regulatory cells in our animal models and upregulation of interferon. So we are cautiously optimistic that the immune mechanism makes sense. Now, it's always really nice if someone else takes what you've invented and they can reproduce what you found and go one step beyond. And so Jill Siegfried, when she was the chair of pharmacology at Minnesota, 
um, 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 felt that uh, non-small cell lung cancer was very similar to head and neck cancer, and she showed in a number of both EGFR mutant, EGFR wild type models of uh, non-small cell lung cancer that decoy had tremendous anti-tumor efficacy, and in one of the most interesting studies, one of her graduate students decided to test whether it had chemopreventive activity. He didn't tell Jill he was doing this, and so he treated a cage of mice with a decoy, a cage of mice with the control, and then gave them the carcinogen. And then about eight months later, Jill got a call from the animal facility who said, uh, you got two cages of mice here. One cage can't breathe and the other cage looks fine. <laughs> and so lo and behold, it became apparent that there was real chemopreventive activity. And this is just a, a histologic look at the mice from the two different groups. But what's really been remarkable is now the NCI Prevent program has picked this up. They created an aerosolized version. And there is now evidence that we can give a STAT3 inhibitor and prevent lung cancer formation. So it's possible that it'll have activity in that setting as well. And uh, this is some uh, um, evidence from Jill's ongoing studies, is that the decoy, when injected, is taken up preferentially in the lung, and they can detect it up to 48 hours after a single injection. But now I want to switch to something that I'm not sure you have thought a lot about, but I really want to encourage you to think this way because it's been so gratifying. My sister is a veterinarian, and she has... Um, um, regaled me with the stories of pet cats who die of head and neck cancer. She, in her suburban clinical practice, uh, sees one to two cats a month. There is nothing to offer these pets, and they all die. She said, can't you do something about this? So uh, moving to UCSF, I realized that Davis was down the block, so to speak. We're one university. I reached out to the oncologists in the vet school, and they were very interested in thinking about a clinical trial. So uh, they confirmed that the uh, immune microenvironment of feline head and neck cancer looks very much like human human head and neck cancer, and that they were very open to doing a clinical trial. And to do a phase one trial in pet cats, you just need an IACUC approval. You don't need an IND. So I'm very pleased to tell you that it took us about a year. We treated 20 cats. And uh, if, if you've never been to the vet hospital at UC Davis, you will want to come back as a pet and be treated there. It is like the nicest hospital I've ever seen. And while I certainly wish I could tell you it was a home run, what I can tell you is that there was no toxicity whatsoever, and we saw two partial responses and five stable diseases, and we're now talking about how to do a randomized phase two, uh, probably comparing it to gemcitabine, which if they use a chemotherapy, is the most common chemotherapy used, and we're talking to the FDA about getting FDA approval for pet cats before we actually get an, an IND to be able to do the trial in humans. So I would like to finish today by saying I think that we're really um, at a point where we should reach out beyond our boundaries. I didn't really know much about Fanconi anemia. Now I think it's the most urgent thing, and I keep thinking if this child was my son, I'd want everybody to be testing his tumor so I knew what to treat him with. So I think there are researchers here at Stanford. I met them in Vancouver about a week and a half ago, but it's mostly in pediatric bone marrow transplant. So those of us with solid tumor expertise, and I can tell you having done this virtual tumor board now for three years, head and neck is the most common malignancy, but we've seen esophagus, we've seen breast, and and we've seen a uh, vulvar. So there are many solid tumors in liver. These patients are developing solid tumors, and we need to figure out how to treat these patients. Prevention is more effective than treatment, even for precision medicine, which is why I'm so hopeful about our aspirin study. And I think that if we anticipate drug resistance as we do smart drug design, we can design even more effective and durable therapies. And, I, and I'd really encourage you to think about clinical trials and companion animals, dogs and cats. The NCI really supports this. Davis is close for you too, and they're very open to uh, collaboration. So I would stop there by thanking all of my uh, collaborators at UCSF and elsewhere and my funding sources. And thank you so much for the chance to come here today. Jenny, great talk. Um, the Fanconi anemia part. What was striking is that it seemed that you say that the, the genomic somatic mutations that occur in sporadic head and neck cancer is virtually identical with what occurs in Fanconi. Is that 
is shocking. Isn't that shocking? Yeah, chromosomal instability. Yes, yes. But then you have the same pattern. You do, um, with the exception of the FA genes. So of course, the, the germline mutations are, are evident in the tumors. Right. But the usual suspects are the usual suspects. Right, and what that seems to be telling something important Yes. about the sporadic form of the disease. I mean, is it saying that Fanconi genes or chromosomal instability processes that, that resemble Fanconi's defects are operable in sporadic head and neck cancer? Because you, you, if you have another mechanism of instability, why do you, you know, wind up with uh, pediatric kinase mutation? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a really, it's a good question. I think the answer is we don't know. Uh, this was really news to everybody. Um, but it, it does make a lot of sense. And the question always has been, why head and neck cancer? And I remember I was at a meeting with Alan DeAndrea, maybe it was like 15 years ago, and the HPV story started coming. We're like, FA. That's why the FA kids get head and neck cancer. It's HPV. But it's not. They don't have HPV. It's HPV negative head and neck cancer. But they're not smokers and they're not drinkers. But I think you're absolutely right. It tells us about the biology of HPV negative head and neck cancer, and we just can't treat the FA patients with the same old toxic drugs that we give to our um, non-FA patients. And the uh, patients who have genetic defects in telomerase maintenance pathways also develop sequelae cell problems. Oh, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. Discaritosis congenita, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely something we need to understand. And of course, <laughs> we all know as head and neck surgeons that transplant patients all develop skin squamous cell carcinoma. <laughs> I mean, this was our, you know, garden variety. It was, this is what we did every week in our clinic. I, 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 in Pittsburgh, it was interesting. They'd had so many uh, unrecognized squamous cell carcinomas in their liver transplant patients because they were smokers and drinkers that we routinely scoped every single patient undergoing evaluation for liver transplant. Not the best use of uh, clinical resources, but it gave us a tremendous experience. And then, of course, they developed squamous cell carcinoma after they were immunosuppressed. Along the same lines, it's kind of interesting that Fanconi's anemia patients get squamous cell cancers of the cervix. Oh, absolutely. Always HPV associated. So why HPV in one cancer in them and not in another? It's a really good question. I think because, uh, and it's actually mostly vulvar cancers, not cervical cancers, but what's probably true is that the role of HPV in the uh, genital tract, particularly in females, is very different from the role of HPV in the oropharynx. I mean, we'd all, we've all thought about could you actually do uh, a pap smear of the throat? And the answer is you can't pragmatically, but also I don't think there's any evidence that would be informative. Because I think that the resident, the, the resident of HPV positive cells in the cervix is durable. And I think that it's a hit and run experience, probably in the oropharynx. Oh, that has been explored. And to my knowledge, there has never been evidence that is sufficiently sensitive and specific or clinically meaningful. Yes. So, for, excuse me, related to HPV, uh, so since EBB, Epstein Barr virus is considered a causative agent in some variants of head and neck cancer, yep. I was curious if you could share what your perspective is on EBV as a potential immunotherapy. Yeah, that's so, so Quinn just walked in. Hey, Quinn. So, um, you know, EBV is really a nasopharyngeal carcinoma. It's not an oropharyngeal carcinoma. The weird thing is that these are just millimeters. I wouldn't even call them separated, and you have two different viruses. And people uh, like Quinn and others are exploring HPV as a therapeutic, EBV as a therapeutic target in uh, nasopharyngeal carcinoma, to my knowledge, is it still investigational and not standard of care? And sadly, the same thing is true for HPV in head and neck cancer. Many have tried to target HPV as a therapeutic modality, and it does not so far appear to be effective. It could be the modalities being tested are in ineffective, but right now all we really can do is prevent HPV-positive cancers with vaccination before sexual activity. With the, with the STAT3 decoy, I, I assume it also <laughs> stimulates the innate immune system as well. So is it to really not have activity in, in tumors that are not STAT3 dependent? That is such a good question. And the answer is we have yet to define STAT3 dependent tumors. I wish I could. And the only models I've had in the lab would be STAT3 knockout models. But of course, they're not relevant in human beings. So um, we're struggling to figure out the population for the phase one trial in humans because 
in the ideal world, you enrich the population for people who are going to have STAT3 dependent tumors. And to the best of our knowledge, there probably isn't such, the only one is T cell leukemia, probably is not STAT3 dependent, um, only because the levels of STAT3 are so, far, so much lower in that hematopoietic malignancy than in others. But there are very few activating mutations of STAT3, and they tend not to be characterized by a cancer syndrome. So we don't really know much about it. But in your, in your animal model, when you did the STAT3 decoy with the uh, point mutation in the nucleotide, that yes. didn't work? No, it didn't, absolutely. Yeah, and I can tell you that in the, the company is now, we're up to 500 milligrams per kilogram in rats, and it's stone cold negative. And, and everybody was worried about a STAT3 inhibitor because the mice are embryonically lethal. Uh, if you knock it out, what would this do to the postnatal immune system? It turns out not very much at all. Yes, sir. Since many of the Fanconi anemias patients are surviving long enough to get cancers because they get stem cell transplant. Are you seeing any difference in the mutational burdens in those patients who had stem cell transplants? That's a really good question. I have to go back to Agata's Nature paper, but to my knowledge, there was no significant difference in the quantity or nature of the mutations in the tumors that arose in patients who had prior transplant versus no prior transplant. The cancers arise in both populations, and the only thing that's been um, dogma to date is that you can't give immune checkpoint inhibitors to the patients who had the transplants. Turns out that may not be true, but again, there's no evidence that these immune checkpoint inhibitors are efficacious. Transplants going to induce more mutations. Uh, cytotoxic preparation. Right, right. To my knowledge, it's not. It, there's no evidence, but let me remind you how rare this is. So it took Agata probably 25 years of collecting tumors to have a sample size of about 60 in order to be able to do a sufficient analysis. And I, I, nobody really knows, but I'm convinced that it's worldwide, and I'm convinced that it's it's not more common than we think, but we've, we are losing opportunities to band together and uh, really study these patients and study their, these tumors because it's so sporadic all over the world. And, and trust me, you know, these, these people who uh, were diagnosed as children do not want to live their adult lives under the cloud of getting cancer. And they, they're not interested in always going to the doctor. They're not interested necessarily in taking a drug that might prevent. And, and we just have to understand both their psychology, their family psychology, and then what we can do about it. But to me, it's just unconscionable that they're not being treated on a clinical protocol so that everybody can learn from the experience. Thank you. Thank you.